Welcome to the Hacking State Podcast. This is your host, Alex Mershak. With me today is Alexander Pacheco. Alexander, welcome to the show. Thanks, Alex. Pleasure to be here. <laughs> Thank you for, for coming on. So <clears throat> you're an interesting fellow. We met here um, in Austin uh, some some number of weeks back, uh, mm -hmm. maybe maybe over a month now. Um, and uh, I was introduced to you by a friend, a mutual friend of ours. Uh, he told me what you did. He told me about um, your social media platform. Um, you also have a, a newsletter on social networks um, over at your Substack. But more profoundly, you're the founder of 150 Inc. So could you tell us, uh, please, Alex, what is 150 Inc.? 150 is a, a new type of social network that bridges the gap between uh, group chats and social media. We, whereas social media is mostly all global discovery where it puts everyone in one place and you can find everyone, anything from anywhere. Well, that's not what our brains are designed for. So we made a local discovery protocol complement. Basically it's how do you make a social network for the human brain? And our brains are not designed to talk to 8 billion people. They're mm -hmm. not designed to make consensus with 8 billion people. And we have the uh, other parts like trust and so, that's really at this core is the thesis of how do you build a social network best designed for the human brain at network scale. Um, so we have a product that's on the app store and we are doing the more of the consumer social uh, route where we try the iterations of fun features, get people uh, hooked and then continue on. Mm. And so the idea of 150 was that the way that social networks are designed right now, it's really just, you know, an open field with every kind of person you can possibly imagine and no real uh, ceiling on the number of connections that you could that you could engage with or or that you could have on your accounts. And why is this incompatible with sort of the human OS? Well, the two main uh, features or parts of 150 are the two main social limitations of the brain. Uh, mm -hmm. One is Dunbar's number, which is uh, your brain's limited to about 150 people. Uh, this is relative to the size of our neocortex and our brain, the outside gray matter uh, versus, uh, versus comparable, you know, primates of like chimpanzees, apes, and they have smaller and smaller neocortex sizes. And so they have therefore uh, smaller tribal sizes. Um, this kind of leads into trust. So it's like, if you don't know someone, how can you trust them? Um, and then the second part of this is that um, friends of friends. So funny enough, we actually do a extension of trust to the second degree. So I can say, hey, I know a really good restaurant. Let's go. Hey, my friend knows a really good restaurant. Let's go. Mm -hmm. Hey, my friend's brother knows a really good restaurant. Let's go. It's kind of like, why are you suggesting that? But most people don't really put up a fuss if you say, hey, my friend. So we're extending this reputation, this trust to the second degree. So the secret here. And this is the secret is it's 150 squared um, with when you have you know, people limited to 150 scale networks uh, where most people have friends in common. So there's some overlap. It tends to be about 10 to 15,000 people. And mm. that's also the size of uh, ancient Roman cities or average cities in the, during the Roman Empire. Mm. So, uh, yeah, that's basically our brains are all designed for local discovery or, li or like limitation which is the one thing that social media can't touch. I don't blame them. Like we really needed it to go in this way. Um, it's centralization. You know, this is part of the network science part of it, but centralization, centralization equals efficiency. We need that. It's very good to do things centralized first, much like building wealth. You centralize on a thing, you build wealth, and then you diversify, you decentralize to stabilize it, uh, balance it out and preserve it. So, uh, so it makes sense that the internet was always gonna grow in this way. Uh, centralized on the most efficient, on the power law distributions of the best apps, the best websites. But when they get there, then we don't know because we only know that one track mindset, grow forever, limitless growth. And what do you do when you have a business model for influencers hmm. and on advertisers? And the whole thing is designed for see more, find more. And if they impose a limitation, well, that, that breaks it. So this is... The next thing will be something that social media can't make. Mm. And that's why the opportunity is there. And why is this better from a user perspective? Uh, what is it about this, this limit conceptually in the mind of connections that causes us 
distress or causes a decrease in trust? Hmm. It's very complex. Um, but we can go through a few parts um, from what you digest, just the content. Um, so social media is an anti-dissension machine. Um, it's going to pro prioritize the familiar and really the opposite mm. um, and deprioritize the the uncommon, the unpopular ideas. And, and in those uncommon, unpopular, you see nuance, you see um, complexity. So like the newest ideas um, emerge mostly from the arts. They ab emerge in, from throughout history in the abstract. So it's not so much a here's the schematic to the next quantum computer. It's someone dreamt of it. It's a painting, you know, that doesn't. So like these abstract ideas are complex and they require time to be distilled down. But what is that process? That is consensus making. And there are, there is a, a good formula how to do high quality consensus making and social media isn't it. Or get there. I mean, so it's you get access to more uncommon and unpopular content. Mm -hmm. So uh, when you're talking with your friends about something that you're very interested in, like, I'm sure you can't go up to the random people on the street and talk about governance and like how technology is impacting it with the future. No, you go to a local network of people mm -hmm. that are more highly relevant, that, are com that we have common interests. And then from there, we're able to talk more deeply because it's localized. So overall, it might not be a popular idea, but localized it is. We see this a little bit in Twitter uh, where you know you'll have like, Fin tech, you know, finance Twitter, tech t Twitter, base Twitter, work Twitter. The algorithms are making these happen. But there's another part about what our brains are used to is that we use um, community boundaries. And to preface, the, I know this is complex. All this is routed around, so it's hard not to mention one thing, but mentioning the other. Well, our brains use community boundaries to mm. fully explore our own identity. So, like, if you look at old school New York City, we had like Hell's Kitchen, Soy's Event, Chinatown. We have all these different little neighborhoods within walking distance of one another. And what they enable for a person to do is to learn who they are. And then if it doesn't check it, check well, you can walk, you can tra travel to another one and then explore there. The problem is with Twitter is that it's very hard to be in a neighborhood mm -hmm. and then unfollow a bunch of things and then refollow a bunch more they have literally you know it's in the algorithm to you know deprioritize you if you start messing with your follower accounts because it's a it's a form of abuse or at least it can be so that because they haven't figured out a solution we're kind of like increasingly tied in like the birds of a feather flock together you just get more and more and more of what you are familiar with and more what's the opposite because it's priming for emotional reactions in the ui you know, what, mm. what you will like and retweet and share and comment, that's that's only going to be things, or really, it's going to be the things that you have an emotional reaction to, which are things you really love and things you really hate. Not things that are hard to understand, that are complex or abstract and new ideas. Those mm. don't elicit emotional responses. Listen, emotional responses, like good propaganda, need to be simple. They need to be repetitive, like a pop song. So, um, yeah, there's, I mean, there's a lot of things that are great about social media. We definitely needed a place, still need a place. It's, by the way, 150 is not a replacement. We do, still need a place that's that global discovery arena to discuss and find and talk about things. But we need another complementary space for our brains where we can explore our own locale that doesn't necessarily need to be in geographic proximity anymore. It just needs to be within that two degrees away uh with people we know people we trust and mm. we're able to have those repetitive conversations over time to hash out the uncommon to find the un unpopular and that's in part why we've been in this cultural drought for over 10 15 years it's coincides with social media so that's that's it in a nutshell i think wow so so you're saying that the uh like the lack of encounter with uh what you're calling the uncommon here mm -hmm. has a lot to do with the the network topology itself exactly. and that it sort of lends itself to these extreme polarizing for lack of a better term forms of content um when you have these systems that are just designed to be these mass aggregators yes um, and so it's great because we get information moving so fast with mm. more and more accounts that have more and more followers it allows for 
information move faster and faster and faster. That's why everyone's on X. That's mm. why everyone, that's anyone like academians, politicians, financiers, um, you know, everybody is there, journalists in the information space because the UI model, and you know this is true because every decentralized social network is decentralized. Mm. It's by data storage, not what actually needs to be decentralized, which is user power. But all the decentralized social networks are just Twitter clones. Why? Because it's the fastest centralized, most efficient, the fastest UI we've been able to conceive so far. Mm. But when we get more and more centralization, we lose out on the network topography of balance and stability. Mm. So we've diminishing returns. We've gone really, really fast, and it's good for throwing out information if like it's a simple fact that needs to be spread. It's really good. It's yeah. bad for consensus making. And we need both. Yeah. So like efficiencies reduce uh redundancy, but they also cause fragility in, in networks. Yes. Um and so what you're describing is is basically like building into the tech itself the structure of a more naturalistic social network, the way that we actually operate in the real world within our own social lives. Yes. Um, it's important to finish that phrase with a purpose because for what? Why? Mm. Like, well, if the purpose in our company is high quality consensus making at scale, and that, that requires trust, it requires trust. Because right now that's what's hurting us. Um, you know, billions of people use these apps daily, billions of people. And they are from which we do all of our global discussions. So, and it's from discussions, it's from talks that we incur war or peace. And it's literally up to these, in some ways they are ancient at this, in internet time, they're ancient UIs. Uh, most people think it, you know, this, these solutions need to happen on a, you know, a very low level at like the, you know, the data storage itself. Um, I say it's like a secondary or tertiary problem. I think people are, that are trying to go that deep are just looking to secure the platform, you know, where like everyone else will have to build on them. It's very like VC minded play, which is about profit and like, don't get me wrong, capitalists love it, but like, don't, yeah, it's, you're telling the wrong story of like, what's not, what's actually not actually true. So uh, yeah, we need to build these for high quality consensus making. That's the mission. That's what we desperately need. Um, so and, and what does, what does high quality consensus making look like? Because obviously there could be a whole plethora of different communities uh, on 150 that have different purposes. Maybe some of them are just for fun or just friends that you know in your local circle. Some of them might have a more mission-driven approach to what they're doing. How do you think um, about the byproduct of high-quality consensus? Um, I will, I'll first say that high-quality consensus making is like is first getting to a conclusion on something hmm. and getting it right. Um, there's, we used to do this in more human scale. I mean, I mean, there's human scale communities still, um, in the world, but the problem is, is that we are all so darn close to each other. So like the, you know, years ago, the average, you know, you ever, you ever heard of the six degrees of Kevin Bacon? Mm -hmm. It's, you know, your, your friend of a friend, of a friend up to six away from Kevin Bacon, but that's kind of true for everyone in the world. However, right. as of just like 10 years ago. Facebook reduced the degrees of average degrees of separation globally down to about three. Hmm. And these, this is not just like a half. It, it's like, it's a power law distribution. So like reducing it from six to three, we are, we've reduced the global average degrees of separation. So close. That's lower than what our brains are designed for. Remember, like we, we give a degree of trust to the second degree. So like, one more way and I'm supposed to talk to everybody it's breaking our trust and it's because they're because they're breaking Dunbar's limit mm. which Facebook exceeded that in about 2011 which you know funny right right around then we saw Occupy Wall Street happen we saw the Arab Spring happen these last like really big great social media efforts uh the Obama campaign 2012 was like we really use social media because uh it allowed it social media was still like human scale about Dunbar scale mm -hmm. and people had trust 
then because it was Dunbar scale, because I knew everyone, I had high trust there, but because I, well, who's in my feed now? It's less of the people I actually know, I'm like public brands and ads and, and my friends that used to just post their stuff. It's a branded version of themselves. So like the trust has dissipated and it kind of works good for that. Like treat it like a nose trust. Like there is zero trust here. Get down to the raw data, raw to the fall fat, down to the, to the facts. And like, we shouldn't be trusting people on social media or in big media. It's just, it's not how it works. With consensus making, there's a formula to do a high, with a high quality. One, uh, you need to, um, uh, views need to be aggregated, not averaged. So when, uh, right now we have like the overtone window that happens where, you know, the, the sides know, hey, if I go more extreme this way, it pulls the average that way. If I go more extreme this way, it pulls the average that way. That's the game we're playing because we're doing a very low quality consensus making. Most people think split the difference, meet in the middle. These are these work for when you're in a local community with high trust because you don't have a lot of people with like a, a bias to like well exploit you or like sociopaths, psychopaths. Um, it's funny, funny. The second part of the equation is uh, no one can be systemically biased in either, any any way. So like paid finance, you know, finance um, have like political favors that they're, that they're owed or owing people and that's going to sway their de decision, uh, which we can we can route these out more when we know the people close to us because we know ev it's mutual knowledge. We know everything that's going on with their lives. Um, and the last part what, of the equation is systemic bias and hmm. Forget it. Comes to mind. It will come to mind. Mm. But uh, basically, we we put this all together, and um, and it creates basically a small, small human scale community that has trust intact. Instilling uh, trust, right, mm -hmm. and high quality consensus. Trust mm -hmm. is the basis for high quality consensus. Yeah, um, you need it. What kind of communities have you seen? are already using 150 to for whatever their their own kind of consensus making might be well it's it's a very personal nature so it's not so like this is used for you know governance at, at larger scale it, it's that when a oh the last thing on the consensus making it's um diversity of views and experiences mm, so okay. like you see when uh, people come to Twitter and it's like that diversity of views. I'm like, well, you only get what you know and the opposite. Well, like think of like your 100 or 150 closest people in your life. Like they are actually a diversity of views and experiences. You like them for different reasons. You have different reasons why you are friends. Um, you know, some is old, you know, just simply you know, old history. Some is like coworkers. Um, some is like through relatives, you know. And, but overall, like, all of these kind of like shape you to where like, well, I know my uncle and he's like, he's different politically. And I, you know, I can't go just totally, you know, ideological because like, that's what San Francisco is. Like no one really there knows a Trump supporter. And so that's what allows the others or they to emerge. But mm. a place like Austin, like everyone knows a variety of people very different than them through friends of friends. Like this is very unusual. And one of the reasons why I'm so bullish on the city. So, um, yeah, it's like, this is not for wide scale governance where it's like, oh, we all come together and just like, shink, there's the answer. It, it, it allows the, the different neighborhoods mm -hmm. to fail. It, it allows them to fail, which means they're unable to, uh, um, they can take greater risk with their ideas. Um, what this means is like allowing them to fail like, well, let's take like a cult, right? A cult is an example of a, of a small echo chamber, which aren't innately bad. We do these, like our friends are homogenous, birds of a feather flock together. So it allows for all of these to have even more and more different ideas. So like conspiracy theories, misinformation, disinformation, which is misinformation at first, disinformation at first, but how do we know? Well, because it's too foreign on social media, we just cancel it because like we can't, it's a liability because the war, the network is so connected, so centralized that like an idea, if it's bad, 
even like juicy, it can get everywhere in just a matter of seconds. Mm. But here, an idea needs to be said, and then it can only propagate out two degrees at a time, two degrees with a Dunbar's number constraint. So yeah, it's like it right. gets to like 10,000. It's like as if, as if everyone had about 10,000 followers. There is no one with millions, but everyone has like 10,000. Mm. So here it can go up to, okay, next it hits a checkpoint before it literally needs to be reposted. All right, who did this come from? Oh, it came from my friend, his friend, got it. He's good. He knows this stuff. I've seen this stuff before, and I can remember this because it's a smaller community. I will pass it along. Boom, yeah. boom, four degrees away. Okay, well, by now it could have maybe have hit a million people. Maybe. More like high hundreds of thousands. But like, you see, from there, it took, you know, two posts to get that far, whereas two posts on social media can be literally anywhere. Yeah, one per, it needs one share from a, an account with 10, 5, 10 million people for to have the idea to be, to be too dangerous, like literally dangerous, mm. uh, because we're really bad at taking in secondary information after we lost it the first time, or after we've made a conclusion or a consensus the first time. So, you know, the propagandists know this. It's about getting your idea out the fastest first. It doesn't yeah. matter if it's wrong. So this just enables us to take more risks because we have a locale, a neighborhood to really, really try a radical idea with. And then if it's good, it can be copied in adjacent neighborhoods, copied in adjacent neighborhoods, much like it's supposed to be. So well, the, the other thing that's interesting about this is that in each layer of the network, uh, there's some degree of trust capital, that's social capital, that's riding on that idea. Um, and so if it's a truly detrimental or repulsive or just too strange idea, um, it's much less likely to spread because people don't want to risk burning their own social capital to do that. Whereas on social media, it's almost like the incentives are, are opposite. Inclusive where versus exclusive. Yeah, yeah. Where mm -hmm. the... Uh, like if you get a hold of a juicy idea that's really controversial, like a really hot take, um, people have an incentive to spread it both to be provocative, but also they have a, an incentive to spread it by posing as the person against it. Mm -hmm. Both of those types will take advantage of uh, an info hazard that's going around and they will both participate in the spread of it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and I know people who use this as an explicit strategy. They find the most controversial or the most incendiary idea that they can and they put it out there or they always make sure to argue against it. Um, but both forms of that are actually continuing to spread, um, to spread the meme further and further. Um, and whereas in your local social network, if you got a reputation as somebody that just like digs up the weirdest, most incendiary thing they can find and then shares it with all their friends, um, Maybe some people would like that, but a lot of people would quickly identify you as a node that just sort of does that over and over again and start to discount that information. Yes. You can actually ostracize somebody. Mm -hmm. On social media, you can't. And that's like our primary way of enforcing social norms. Remo removal from the tribe. We can't do that anymore on social media because we have, well, you're just a number, man. Like you're just a follower. I can get 10 more like you in that much time. But like here, uh, you know, it's not just you have the potential to lose me. You have potential to lose my 150. Mm. And, and because we're kind of, you know, there's a hard cap on like, if all your 150s were different and none of them overlap, you can get maximum 22,500. You can hit end game pretty quickly, but like, that's it. So once you hit there, okay, well. What do I want? It's like, do I want this to spread it? Well, I want that my 150 in that second degree to the, be the most powerful, most influential people I can do if, if my goal is really far outreach, which it can't. You know, like, that's how you do like the second part. It's like you get to end game and then you start doing like the end game stuff, which is increasing the quality and influence of each one of those people. But those types of people are going to have higher and higher and higher standards for the information that's coming into through them. Uh, not just for them, but for them to even share afterwards, not just to digest, but to share. Mm. And so here, the game, the rules of the game are different. 
um, it's not really so much how do I get the largest following. I mean, from a network science perspective, this is really be, how do you become the center of the network, and the and then it's the center of which network, the global network on one fifty. Mm-hmm. There's value in that. There's also value in being the center of the, you know, the liberal or the conservative network or like the skiing network, the cooking network, like much like how Twitter is operating, but they use an algorithm to sort through all this noisy data. And that's a lot of noise here. We don't have any noise. You only get the signal that you choose. And so ultimately, I think this is just a signal to noise ratio problem again which we've had through every step of communications technology from telegraphs to, you know, telephones, television signal, undersea internet cables. Now is just the social network moment. And what's the common variable? Well, it's how do we make it high signal and low noise for humans? Mm. And uh, well, so that's how you do it. It's a Dunbar's number constraint and only uh, discoverable up to friends of friends because that's how far we put trust. And that's it. But it's also it's also bi-directional. Yes, it's not follower following. Mm. Yes. Yeah, so it's not a broadcast the, model. Right. And this is gonna help uh it's gonna help uh, round out a lot of fake relationships. Hmm. Well, because like I get a ton of bots following me all the time. Yeah. And I never know what my actual follower count is because occasionally they'll go through and wipe out the bots and then I'll lose like 50 followers overnight. And I'm like, what happened? And I realize they just Whooped, wiped away the detritus. Yeah. Um, but the other part of this is like when it when you were talking about the quality mining, like this getting to the get like increasing the quality of the network rather than just the sheer size as the most yes. important factor. That was really compelling to me because that's something that I consciously try to do on Twitter, but it's actually very hard to do so because hard. of the way the network is set up. Exactly. So for example, and, and you said that the algorithm punishes you for this. I'm sure. If that's the case, that's that's happened to me because I will occasionally go through my follows and I will try to do like a giant purge and I will purge a bunch of accounts that either I'm not interested in anymore or that I don't really, you know, I notice that they bother me when I see them in my feed or I just don't really remember why I followed them, whatever it is, right? Um, and over time, I imagine that what I'm doing is I'm getting higher and higher quality follows. Um, but the, the issue on Twitter is again, like, even if I try to continually do that cycle and I do do it from time to time, um, I don't necessarily control a lot of what else they put into my feed. Right. So then I'm muting people that I want to still follow, but I don't like their retweets. And, and it's this whole problem where you can't really escape the bad incentives. Yes. I mean, remember, it's good for some things, but it's getting increasingly limited what that use case is. It's it's good for sending out like the binary facts, like true or false, or like mm-hmm. memes of culture, not just meme joke, but like el- like t- small pieces of culture. Like because we've lost the trust, because we don't have control over our signal or noise, because uh, the incentives of the game because we gamify everything the incentives of the game are for just simply grow forever more engagement more follows and there's no cap and if they impose that limitation it would be the end of their model it changes what it's capable of doing there's like a there's that like old quote that's like imagine a being who's omniscient omni- omnipotent and omnipresent what does such a being lack limitation hmm. that's exactly social media they, the one thing that they need most is the thing that they can't do because they built their business model on it. It's limit things. Limit the amount of people people can follow um, and limit um, discovery. So like, yeah, it's... And if they did that, well, one other one wouldn't and they would grow bigger and their information would move faster, which like people, like people would go for that, but they wouldn't get it. They wouldn't get much from it. Yeah. We're missing the consensus making element of this, which we had on the early days. And that's what enabled back when we were at Dunbar's number scale. That's what enabled Occupy Wall Street. That's what enabled the Arab Spring is because we were human scale and our trust networks were still barely there. Mm-hmm. They're still barely there to where like we hear something and we would pass it on to everyone. We're like, oh crap. 
Like they, we were still in the mode of like, I trust all of these things because they're just my friends. So it worked then, but now it's hit them with misinformation, disinformation, and propaganda fast first, and then you win. So. Yeah. Another word for thinking about limits is constraints, right? You only get beautiful things in art, in evolution, in ideas, by adding in constraints. Yeah. And if you start taking them away, it's very hard to get anything coherent at all. Because mm. yeah. you're just in a sea of chaos. It's the thing we need most, even at a philosophical level. It's like we're in an age of excess. It's like more dopamine, more more everything. Like mm -hmm. just more, 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 more. And, uh, you know, just a hard limit is what you know the world overall needs mm. <laughs> but uh, that's a hard lesson to learn i think so so 150 isn't running on an uh on on advertisers one would assume yeah, uh subscription it's a subscription model yeah right now we're offering everyone one year free and then it's two dollars a month afterwards mm. uh, i mean what x is doing where they're trying to move more and more to subscription um like they need to that would enable them to get away from their influencers and ads model more, which would give them a bit more playing room. And there are some creative solutions to this. I'm not, not ready to speak on them here in public, but um, yeah, but the first thing is like, you need to get it to subscription. People can't be the product. Uh, we see what happens when you do that plus 10 years. Mm. So. Yeah. yeah. The other thing is it, it will get rid of the bots and spammers and just low quality accounts in general are not going to pay even a, a nominal cost, like a, well, like a no, small I cost. They'll, they'll pay if they can get the money back, if they make the money for it. Like wow, World of Warcraft is sure. $15 a month and they have bots and gold buyers, like bots will pay. It will help get a, a lot of them away. But the, the, the thing that about us that um, beats bots better is that you only have 150 spots for friends. Like you can get up to that number pretty quickly mm. and then you have to remove someone to add them in. Mm. That's valuable real estate. Why would you add someone that you don't know? And like, sure, they can masquerade themselves as, you know, a friend's account, but like you can also just text your friend, like, did you say this? Or like, this didn't look right. Or like, you look, what friends do we have in common? Oh, none. I thought we had a hundred friends in common. Like yeah. it's very, very easy to route out bots in this local discovery network, much like it is to route out sociopaths or psychopaths in a human scale network. Because very, very quickly, everyone just starts removing them from their network. Yeah. And if they, if they get in at all, they're not there for long. So what happens when you have a high signal, low noise social network with very low bots? Well, actually, the, um, the Observatory for Social Media Research at University of Illinois Bloomington actually conducted this and they found that when you, the amount of bots in a network hits over just 1%, the quality of information drops. Just 1%. Mm. But if you can keep it low, less than that, then you can maintain a high quality informa of information because you have trust that can keep in intact there. So we all know it's more than 1% on social media and it's impacting the flow of information. That's in part A, and then part B is the human scale element. But yes, bots are a big issue. So for new users that are, I mean, I guess one of the one of the interesting things about this is that you're you're not positioning it as, oh, this is a platform where you can become the next big influencer. You can, you know, you can become pseudo famous, some internet famous on this platform. It's positioned as something that is a a little carve out a neighborhood for you and your friends um and their friends and their friends yeah yeah and you yeah. think that's something people are missing in their their online experience right now um it, they're missing it in the way that they're don't they are missing efficiency of communication through their network because if I wanted to send something out to like all my friends of friends you know, for like an event invite or whatever, actually the event uh, apps like Party Phone and uh, the other one, uh, they are enabling this more and 
now, but uh, it's really difficult if I just make like a Facebook post for any sort of information when I want to get the word out there because the, uh, the algorithm is, again, it's going to prioritize the familiar, prioritize the emotional. And if I can't articulate it in that way, where I just want to say it, uh, it doesn't really get spread. So here it's like, it's actually a yes, no to your question. Where it's like, hey, we're not saying you can be famous. Actually, it's like, hey, here you can be as famous as you can possibly be. Famous in the way before you hit diminishing returns. Um, I, I talked to some more other influencers, like people have larger accounts and the consensus generally is that like around 10 to 20,000 afterwards, they don't really notice much of a difference. Uh, because I mean, think back to the earlier days of the internet when we were all getting online and having like a hundred friends mm. on MySpace or early Facebook, like that was plenty. Like if I had a question or I want to get opinion or share something, I had more than enough feedback. That's what you're really wanting is feedback. But now your whatever it is that you're sharing can be a whole wide range of things uh, while you're fighting for an attention economy against, you know, billion dollar companies that are optimizing to get your friend's attention by any means necessary. So here you simply just don't need to fight for your friend's attention. And that makes a 10,000 people of friends of friends. I'd say even more powerful than 500,000 or even a million social media followers. Because here, it well, it depends what you're spreading, but those closest to you are most likely to be like you, and it, it continues out um, roughly two degrees. So you'll, you'll be able to spread a job posting, an event, uh, a restaurant you like, some music that you made, Things here spread faster because of the low bot pollution, high trust, and uh, giving everyone the ability to spread it out to two degrees. Where like 91% of Instagram users, users have less than 10,000 followers. This is for the 91%. Mm. It actually would give them a bit more. It would actually give them a bit more. So like, if you look, if you look at this like an information war, um, yeah. all right? Um, social media is an offensive weapons technology. Uh, this is a defensive weapons technology, whereas it's a, like a decentralized weapons technology in the way of like, it's like giving everyone an AR-15 in the age of information war. Everyone now has ability to spread because we have freedom of speech, but not free, freedom, freedom of spread. Mm. And like that is a big issue because it's the spread that matters for everything. Uh, but here it's like we can enable both because even if there's uh, 150 neo-Nazis, like the ideologies themselves will generally route themselves out in the way of uh, if, an, if an ideology can't keep growing in power, meaning getting new members or like getting more influential people in, they, they then turn to stage two, which is pure five. And so they start to look for who's the least pure in their ideology and get rid of them. Mm. And, all, and over time, those 150s of Nazis would start to be more and more friends with each other, but like they would shrink because that second degree, because they don't want, they want the most pure. And they wouldn't shrink into the center of the network, they would shrink away to the edge of the network where like, who are they really connected to here? Very, very few people. And then eventually no one. There'll be a network island where their information mm. can't go anywhere. And uh, people try to say, like, this is dangerous because, like, like, but that's just a group chat. Like, that's just a private group chat. It doesn't matter if it's on Signal or WhatsApp, iMessage, Telegram, et cetera. Yeah. If it's an island. That's fine. But, like, it becomes a much bigger issue when it's connected to a larger network where they can quickly spread the information before we have time to do the checkpoints of reputation, checkpoints of trust, check it out before spreading but like, you know, you've seen this, something comes up on Twitter and like, you're like, oh, that seems weird. Let me do some research, do some research, do some research. And even just over a course of a few hours, which like would take you time to do it. The story is already moved. It's already spread. It's spread to everywhere it needed to be. And so now you're like, oh, well, here's my corrections. And now we have like community notes to help. But really, like it's it, it helps, but like, it doesn't fix the problem. 
Hmm. Well, with fixing the problem, it's not only like having it spread in the first place, but that's, I get it. It's hard to do with the architecture. Yeah. Well, I find it really interesting, this point about uh, weaponry, weaponry and the information war about how this uh, increasing the signal to noise uh, ratio gives you or decreasing the signal, right? Yeah. No, increasing, increasing. increasing the signal to noise ratio gives the individual much more leverage and power than they have in the other nice. network structure. Because, for example, well, first of all, I'd say I think most people's networks are a lot more powerful and stronger than they think. If you were actually to mine your own network, the people that you just know already, and try to get something important out there or try to get a business started or whatever it is, a lot of people are afraid to tap their own network for resources. But if you were to, I think a lot of people would be surprised at how powerful the network they already have is. Yes. Um, the other component of this, though, is like, if I have a bunch of Twitter followers, 90%, maybe 95%, maybe even 98 or 99% in some cases of them don't really care necessarily about the thing that I care about the most, right? They followed me for all kinds of other reasons. You know, maybe they just think that what I'm doing is interesting. Maybe they, uh, you know, want to follow me because they're keeping tabs on me. They think I'm their competition. Maybe they don't like me and they're hate following me. There are a lot of all kinds of reasons, you know, maybe they followed me because something I did two years ago went viral and they just forgot to unfollow me. Like there are a lot of reasons why these people might be following you. And um, in order to get anything out, you have to have like this giant, extremely powerful cannon. You have to have so many followers because the message ends up being so diffuse, right? Whereas in the structure you're describing, I don't need a giant cannon. All I need is a high density network. And then my message goes out and it just starts propagating in a, in a, in a likewise fashion. And it's propagating to the nodes that also think that it's, or that are more likely to think that it's relevant to them. Yeah. It's like so that's an interesting, run, whereas social media is like flack. Yeah. Yeah. So that, that's an interesting concept to consider. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, I'm, I'm rethinking my own strategies right now <laughs> as we're having this discussion. Yeah. Well, social media, the game makes it so that you should appeal to the widest possible audience. Um, but like, it's like centralized first and then decentralized. So you want to appeal to the widest, you know, like the whole, find your niche. Like that's a strategy first is like, find your niche, like dominate it and then mm. move out and go wider and wider. And so as people kind of get wider and wider and wider with their followings, their, you know, their, their initial views and ideas, like you said, would be diffused. Like, like they have to appeal, like, no one's going to get to like 10,000 followers and be like, I'm good because like the followers will even keep coming and it would, it kind of like requests more from them. It requests, you know, it just, the game does it for you. It's like in systems engineering, you know, you make a system and then the system takes over a life of its own. Same as being true with anyone, anyone with a following. So, um, yeah, the the following here is uh, it's different in the way that it changes the game. And if you had more control, where like on social media, you really don't. If you had more control of your inflows, um, it will the right combination of them. Because or, let, let me give an adjacent you know part of this in network science, there is. Um, there's regular centralization, which most people know as um, uh, like popularity centrality, mm. which is like, how many friends do you have? Everyone knows that one. But there's, there's one called like eigenvector centrality, which is a fancy word for like, how many second degree in influence do you have? Because like, like sure, you have like, um, you know, a million first degree followers, but like how many of them are bots, right? So second degree is that like, what is it really like? you know, three, four million versus if, Hey, if you have, you know, a hundred thousand, you know, first degree 
followers and it's like really dense and then like the second degree and like high quality second degree is like three four million well like those that's a better way of measuring someone's like real reach another one is like uh betweenness centrality it's like being a bridge so like uh cosimo medici during the renaissance uh mm. he was a powerful connector of information between enemies but when he was exiled all those communication lines went down the enemies couldn't communicate which means they couldn't do business which means the whole network itself the whole system decreased in power right this made it weak which made enabled him to come back years later and overtake the network with by restilling his old connections and then defeating his rival and exiling his rival so like you can't do this really on social media because of the network structure and network topography. But on 150, you can say, hey, I want to be the bridge between, um, uh, let's do like the People's Party in Spain and like the communists. Mm. Like, like what accounts are, how do you be like the best bridge? Because uh, how do you be the Cosmo Medici in that information network? There's no way to really architect that simply and easily. On 150, there is. It's like, oh, I just need to add a few people from here and a few people from here. And anything that I share, both people get. Or if anything I, you know, I say, both will be meeting in my comments. Yeah. And like you become a very powerful node, not because of the amount of degree of degree centrality or like uh, eigenvector centrality and popularity centrality, like it's because of your betweenness. And like, mm -hmm. there are all these other measures of networks. And you know, you said uh, my, the network that I have or people realizing the networks they have. I say the networks that we are, like we are an individual mm -hmm. and we are networks at the same time. But I would make a case that we are more so a network than an individual. It's through our network, through people that we discover new ideas, new stories, new opportunities, new friends, um, new spouses new like life happened like you can look back at your life and and the big changes were always connected to a uh, one or a few people like that initiated the change that were the catalyst people are the catalyst and we just don't have those connections uh anymore like we need to have people realize that they are a network they they don't just have one they are one and it's their friends that shape them and give them that control again so mm. yeah Wow, that's a that's a very powerful sentiment right there. Um, so, how has adoption and reception of uh, one hundred and fifty been so far? Uh, it's been good and bad because there's two parts of this. One, it was started out as a research project, hmm. turned it into a startup, and the thing with consumer social, we are a very unique industry that is ruled by giants. Um, it's not an excuse to play victim, but to understand that winning in consumer social means uh, it means that you can't simply just make a solution and have it work. Most people don't know this, but like our last two big social networks, I mean, it was like, let's say Instagram, um, uh, Facebook, MySpace. These are our social spaces. I, I, I don't include Twitter because it was really more of a information tool than mm. a social network like our last social networks instagram uh facebook uh myspace you put it out this way instagram was the most recent or actually let's start let's start with myspace myspace was seeded with 30 million email accounts from a company that's the only reason it succeeded like we already had friends there and stuff like that but what really got people on social was that the friends were always there and their friends were all there because they got seated with 30 million accounts. Hmm. You know, Facebook wasn't really a uniquely like brilliant idea. Like it was nice that it was exclusive and like we fought to exclusivity, but it wouldn't have worked if they didn't get the mailing lists, the email lists of all the top finals clubs at the world's most exclusive university all at once. That's a cold start problem. And then when you finally got something like an Instagram comes along, they went wide with a bunch of features. They found one that worked with the photo filters, zeroed in on it, started blowing up, 
And then Facebook's like, we got to buy these guys because they actually are being threatened by an organic growth. Um, now, this would have been done if you could throw $2 million at the problem, but social had, you know, especially from the VC perspective, uh, they are trying to, to uh, de-risk an inherently risky asset class. And so saying, oh, well, I've been pitched thousands thousands of social products before social startup ideas because everyone uses social media and they they think oh i could be the next facebook and how do you do it they say well here's a problem that we all have and everyone says uh-huh yeah social media sucks and then they then they say so therefore this solution is x and like it's really meaningless there's no reasons why that's the solution they just say so and the difference between the the uh, companies getting a shot and those that aren't is if you have, you know, some Ivy League co-founders um, or like, you know, second time founders or third time, you know, like successful like exits, exits and or uh, personal relations with a VC or something like. So the point here is, is that you can't make these work really through the traditional means of simply showing them. Uh, how the solution works from the scientific perspective that um, that no one else has taken. Like no one has taken like human human like our neuroscience or network science and said here is scientifically how you solve it, and here's the reason why. Anyway, so what we're doing is that we've produced all the features like Instagram did the first time, and we had we found our one thing that works very well, and mm -hmm. what we have to do is spin up a. A social graph first and then gradually enable the features out again which will have them brought over so uh we'll be doing a re-release of our product at the end of the summer which will be uh an anonymous friends of friends app so you will come on here and add your 150 which those people you know but in an anonymous space uh it will be friends of friends so you don't know if it's like a very very close like top five friend or a you know far off far off friend, but what this does is it creates a new new type of anonymous ecosystem, uh, which uh, enables uh, let's see uh, gossip shaming and rallying. Gossip shaming and rallying. These sort these sorts of uh, anonymous chats, like anonymous communication, are actually really um, they induce high trust because we don't need just legislation to enforce you know social behaviors like affirmative action and i think it's crap but like we all we, social behaviors really should be done through social norms mm -hmm. um and so here is like how like you give a man a mask i'll show you he really is it's like well people are all scared of being canceled and that's why over and over again anonymous anonymous apps spin up over and over and over again but they don't go anywhere because they restrict, restrict themselves to a college campus or they say, all right, well, everyone's anonymous here. Like, how are we going to build from here? They, they get stuck. Uh, but the way to get over that is to build a social graph overlay on top of the anonymous layer and then eventually open up public with the social graph already there. So like if I was able to plug into Facebook's API, but they killed this back in like, 2015 or so or maybe maybe after the cambridge analytica thing mm. i forget but if i could plug into facebook's api then these other social products mine or otherwise would actually have a fighting chance to try rapidly new ideas that but ultimately we would be you know reliant on facebook not shutting us down just not pulling the api but we know that they copy product ideas they do this thing where they like re-release them and and uh in Barcelona, in uh, Brazil, because no, like Portuguese, the language barrier, and they check and see if like, hey, this American app, but with our Brazilian users, and if it works, then they just copy it and like eliminate competition. Um, yeah, so that's where we're at. We'll be doing a product relaunch towards the end of the summer, um, but we are available on the App Store on uh, 150. Um, what is, What is the the purpose of the anonymous layer? Um, the anonymous layer is what keeps people it creates a viral feedback loop very very short people love gossip they love uh, i mean they don't love being shamed but mm. they love if 
participating in shaming and they love okay. rallying. Um, and so it's, it's like, remember like Nikita Beer's gas app? Mm. Yeah, like there's a reason why he keeps rebuilding the same anonymous polling app over and over again. They successful people like Yik Yak and all the Yik Yak clones. Yeah. Anonymous keep, why does 4chan still work how many years later? Like, and like, and like work. But the point is that we, we need that anonymous nature because it's the thing that's missing most um, mm. from social media where like we can really say what we want to say. Uh, but 150's anonymous version is unique in the way that it. we don't need to use a, an algorithm uh, to make the content relevant, even an anonymous. You will do that by choosing your 150 and then 150 is 150. Like it will automatically make the anonymous chatting far more relevant than other anonymous apps because you'll be building out your high trust network with a limitation on it um, built in. Eventually, when your network gets up to like thousands of friends of friends, then we can start to un allow unlocking for the public layers of the app, which will be basically be, I mean, it's on our app now. They're called squares and it's just Reddit, but friends of friends, basically. So you yeah. basically get these little hashtag forums, uh, but maximum friends of friends, and you can post automatically out to all these. All right, okay. Alexander Pacheco, 150. Thank you so much for coming on the show. You're welcome. Um, where, where can people go get on the app? How can they get into the network? Um, you can search 150 on the Apple App Store. We're just on Apple. Uh, you can look at my Substack, uh, alexpacheco.substack.com. And uh, I'm on Twitter, naturally, X, as uh, Alexander Curves, C-U-R-V-E-S. Hmm. All right. Well, till next time. All right. Thanks, Alex. This was fun.